Hello, listeners everywhere. Welcome to this episode of Top Line. I'm back. Asad and AJ tried to run the show without me. <laughs> it went pretty well, actually. <laughs> I, I thought that was the better part of the conversation from last week. Sam, even the intro to Top Line Hotline, it was it was done. Just that was that was really well, a struggle. we haven't heard it yet. We haven't heard it yet because it hasn't come out. We're recording this on a Tuesday, and Top Line Hotline comes out on a Thursday. So I haven't even heard what happens. We felt so your absence to... there. We felt your absence there. This is Top Line. Thank you for tuning in. This episode was brought to you by the Revenue Optimist community and Traction Complete. You can learn more, watch the latest episode, and find the Revenue Optimist under resources on Traction Complete's homepage at tractioncomplete.com. Shall we? Uh, how's everybody doing? AJ, how are you? Uh, good. Guess where I'm going tomorrow? Boston? No. No. Austin? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking Kirks the kids. We're Kirks and K- I wish I was. No, we're doing an RV trip. I'm going to Vegas uh, with the girls and we're running an RV and the five of us are hitting up Zion, Grand Canyon, Sedona, oh Flagstaff. That's really cool. This is going to be so awesome. I know. Take I, some pictures was, and send them to us. When was the last time you, I mean, actually, no, I kind of know the answer to this, but I'll ask it anyway, because our listeners don't. When was the last time you two truly, truly, truly unplugged? Ooh. Mm. Italy. Last year. I don't know that I've ever truly unplugged in <laughs> recent memory. Yeah. And neither have I, but I bought a flip phone, a razor from Walmart. Those were the best. I used to love that phone back in the day. Well, I have one and only two people have the number for it. So oh my God. I'm going to. This I'm is going cool. To... <laughs> yeah, that's this awesome. very, cool. very cool. I've heard Zion is freaking beautiful. Uh, we've driven through it, the Narrows. I'm excited to hike the Narrows with the girls. It, it, first off, they can only hike like 50 feet, so I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. But um, yeah, we're gonna do it. I'll Who are the picture. two people that have your Razor flip phone phone number? His mom, obviously. My mom is one of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other one has to be work related, right? Like somebody no, at the company. It's Ange, Ange and his mom. Has it. Yeah, oh, wow. but I will so give it. No one. I'm gonna, from... I'll give it to Ryan Milligan. Yeah, and, I was gonna then... say. I know. I know AJ so well at this point. I called all three in order. <laughs> yeah, that was really good. <laughs> he, <did>. <laughs> <laughs> he truly did. That was so good. <laughs> I was about to say Milligan. Yeah, there's gonna be people listening to this. They're gonna be jealous of it, and I'm gonna get angry. Well, neither you nor I are in the phone, Asad. So we I know, should I'm know. a little bit disappointed. Most... Yeah. <laughs> What yeah, if I had okay, an article you... I needed you to read? <laughs> Austin, Sam showed up to this this uh, podcast before we started recording and said, like, he invited, he's inviting this person to his board. When do we get invited to his board? I huh? You're on my personal I don't, I advisory have... board. You're on my personal <laughs> advisory board. That is board. true. We <laughs> and you, both, you both have equity in Pavilion as well. I do. So. Yeah. Yeah. I value that equity a lot. We're, one of the things we're talking about today is refreshing the ambassador program, which I'm excited Ooh. about. Thanks. Austin, how are you? I'm good. I'm a little bit sick for the last week or so, um, but otherwise I'm good. Good health. Good. Mentally. Well, I just got back from uh, from some time in Barcelona. What a beautiful oh, city. That's what I have to wild, say about that. It's wild, right? It's like Paris, but with good weather. I yeah. Usually. And it's it's a little bit more chill than Paris, I think. Yeah, no, the people are much nicer. Much nicer. Did you walk around? Did you do any I walking? I walked everywhere. I went for three big runs, wow. uh, which if you're a part of the pavilion group on Strava, you can you you already know that. And got some Where nice in Barça were you from... living? Excuse me? Where were you living in Barça? Like, where did you decide to stay? Oh, uh, in Echample. So uh, nice. it's like, I don't know, middle of the city, in port, sort of the nice part near, near Diagonal. My mother's favorite city, Barcelona. Yeah. It's a good yeah. place. All right, let's get started with our docket. Enough banter. Okay. Asad, I kick it over to you, sir. So today we're going to break down uh, startup compensation and chat a bit about the talent market in tech because we have two really powerful reports that have come out. We have Pavilion's 2024 comp report and we have Carta's H2 2023 state of startup compensation report. And so the natural place to start is looking at hiring and layoffs 
Um, so in 2022, Tata companies made 523,000 hires. And tw uh, 2023 saw that number almost cut in half to about 267,000. Now, for some context, Tata services about 50% of the ecosystem. So it's not a complete lens on the market, but it's a really good one. In 2021 and 2022, net headcount at VC-backed companies increased, but in 2023, it decreased by 18,377. Why? There were a lot of layoffs. 263,000 people were laid off globally in tech across 1,191 companies. Now, overall, departures have been outpacing hiring in Carter's data set, which is a new trend because for the most of the past four years, companies were hiring more than than the departures. I went into LinkedIn to do some specific research and see uh, what I could find. And I found something interesting, which is that in the last 12 months from today, 1 million, 1.6 million folks in tech have found new jobs in the past 12 months. And there are currently about 600,000 new jobs posted in tech with NYC New York being the number one location, not San Fran. That was quite interesting. A few other data points, 43% of startup employees have less than two years of tenure. Startup hiring has tilted back towards engineering. Uh, in 2022, 24% of hiring was engineering. In 2023, it's 27%. And this is fascinating, an increased focus on individual contributor talent. In 2019, 50% of hiring at companies with less than $100 million valuations were ICs and 46% at companies with above $100 million valuation. In 2023, it's 60% for both. So Sam, this increased focus on engineering talent and IC talent, especially the IC talent, seems really interesting. You've spoken a lot about how we need more people with hands on keyboards. So talk to us a little bit about how this trend makes you feel. And do you see this sustaining itself as the market picks up? There's more hiring, there's more growth. Um, does this sustain? I don't. I think the focus on individual contributors is interesting for the reasons that we've discussed over the previous couple of weeks, which is that organizations are consolidating their C-suite and VP level headcount. I think mm -hmm. people are saying we don't need a chief business officer, a chief growth officer, a chief revenue officer, and a chief sales officer, et cetera, et cetera. And I think therefore it makes perfect sense to me that what people are really saying is, I can cut through middle management layers. Certainly that's what Zuck said at, at Meta. And I need more people doing actual work. And so the focus on individual contributors makes perfect sense to me. Does that mean that this trend will continue? I, I guess my sense is that I don't see it changing in the near term, maybe in the medium term. I think you know, we know that there's a lot of funding and a lot of company creation and a lot of value creation that's happening up and down the supply chain around AI. We don't yet know how those companies will go to market at scale. We know that OpenAI mm. is hiring a large enterprise sales team and building yeah. out a big go-to-market organization. We know, or I know personally, that companies that sit uh, behind those companies, so companies such as Invisible, which uh, provides a lot of the training contractors that train the large yeah. language models mm -hmm. for uh, companies that are trying to build their own models. Invisible is doing absolutely amazing uh, and crushing it. And I think well over a hundred million in revenue and they're technically a services business, but yeah. nevertheless, um, so they're going to need more sales people and, uh, and a larger go to market organization. So I think that, I just don't know if that's enough to overcome the reality that there's a lot of uh, growth stage B2B SaaS software businesses that rather enjoy having high sales efficiency and mm -hmm. rather enjoy having very high quota attainment with a small number of reps mm -hmm. and are somewhat more uh, jaded when it comes to being preached conventional wisdom about how many middle managers they need and how many additional support staff they need. I think everybody's got religion around revenue operations and thinks that's an area where you need to invest and you need to invest in enablement to a certain degree. But I think most people are saying, you know what, I, I don't need an AE manager and a VP of sales and a CRO. What I need is a couple of people to close deals. So I don't see that changing this year. Sounds uh, yeah. Do you think that a lot of the reason why we develop these really 
big management layers in companies as we grow is this understanding that there's this ideal ratio of individual contributor to manager somewhere yeah. between six to one to ten to one depending on function if it's in yeah, market. conventionalism is seven to one seven to one let's say right yeah. um but then in the last bit we've heard all these stories of great leaders uh elon musk jensen Huang, who have 40 plus direct reports they don't do any one-on-ones etc so i i guess the question is do you think that we have gotten this ratio wrong that maybe we don't need seven to one maybe it can be 12 to one that would be one way that as we stabilize and we get back to growth that as companies are scaling the management layers are not scaling that much is that possible do you see that playing out i don't see it playing out but i could be wrong i think something needs to i think the reality is that we have a very large group of people that have come into the workforce in the last five years that have basically never worked in an office that have never been exposed to pre COVID professional working standards, as we've talked about a lot. I think there's a large group of other people, you know, Lemkin talked about it at CEO summit for pavilion. He called it the lost generation. So in that reality, what do those people need? If we're going to take middle performers and get them up to top performers, at least in the sales organization, Mm -hmm. I don't see it changing. Maybe there's other organizations where through automation, through better enablement, maybe just radically great hiring, maybe Elon and Jensen are so good at hiring that really they're just nudging people over the course of every couple of weeks. But on the front lines, I think you still are going to have lots of people that need pretty regular coaching, and I don't see that changing. I'd like to hear what AJ thinks. AJ, what do you think about all of this? Mm -hmm. Well, (laughs) isn't AI just taking our jobs? Aren't we all supposed (laughs) to? (laughs) It's taking my job. That's for sure. (laughs) I heard two things in those uh, stats and what you said. I heard tactical and I heard IC work. And we talk a lot about revenue operations and sales leaderships because it's where the three of us, like, it's where we have had our backgrounds, our energy. But uh, I was listening to a podcast, Lenny's podcast, uh, Mar- Marty Kagan. And Marty's mm-hmm. a, a product leader that's very well known. And it was just over the weekend. Uh, Lenny's podcast is pretty well known. And he talked about this in product and what was going on in product. And you have product operations and you have product analysts and you have all of these things things that exist. And at the end of the day, it's all about outcomes and customer outcomes. And the focus on this, there was, there was this conversation around feature teams versus outcomes. And mm-hmm. he was basically creating this like, it, it was definitely, a con, I don't say contrarian, but con, conflictive point of view as a product leader and was all, outright saying, this is what no one wants to hear, but it needs to be said. And needs to be outright said that there's too much bloat, there's too much going on in product where no one's doing anything except trying to just like ship features and being told what to do. And we need leaders that are tactically minded. This is true across the entire organization. So I 100% agree with that. I think the thing that is interesting in some of the stats that you said, though, Asad, is you said 1.6 million entered the workforce, re-entered? No, 1.6 million people found new jobs in tech in the last 12 months. That's out of about a population of 16 million in North America. And most of that's engineering? No, it's well distributed across various functions. But yes, engineering hiring has picked up. It's about 27% of all hiring is engineering. Yeah, I uh, I agree on the sales efficiency and enjoying. It's it's a fun it's it's fun to have your sales team win or your CS yeah. team win or whatever like the your that that attainment win. And I think a lot of us are feeling those wins. Um, I know the three of us have enjoyed uh, the last few months or quarters and have had wins that we've talked about on the show. But I would also say that that we're just also balancing that with the rest of the organization and just ensuring and the things that I look at in my organization from an operational efficiency are just like, sure, delivery of roadmap, but like, do I tactically understand the things that are going to move the needle in every single department? Am I am I actually seeing that? And as our teams have gotten smaller, it's brought a lot of visibility and, and uh, there's a light that's been shown yeah, on those, those teams, right? And I just, uh, I've enjoyed that, but I also still struggle with it at the end of the day, as we've talked about ad nauseum, not being in the office. And this is something Marty says in the podcast is for product teams, it's killed uh, innovation and productivity. He That's said it outright. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, um, 
just to echo what we're talking about, which is that I don't. So by the way, I said the other reason that, um, you know, that man- management layers expand is not just because of span of control debates. It's because uh, companies thought they needed growth paths for their employees. And in a tight labor market, you're like, I, everybody wants to be a manager, so I need management paths. And then once you make somebody a manager, then they want to expand their team. So there's this natural gravity that happens when, and, and you know, sometimes I think in, uh, in other podcasts, they call them like surplus elites, but it's like all of these people that aren't really doing much, but sitting, but are sort of middleware connecting upper management and people actually doing the work. And I remember for personal experience over the last year, you know, as I've mentioned, you know, we were trying to build a product and engineering organization. And, you know, we had a head of product uh, and, and uh, there were eight people on the team. And I realized at one point that we had uh, just three people pushing code out of eight. And we had a, and I did a bunch of research. I called a bunch of product leaders and I said, you know, what do you think about all of this? And they all not uniform, but pretty uniformly, they said, I'm not sure you even need a head of product. And I said, why don't I need a head of product? They said, aren't you the head of product? I said, no, no, no. I need like a translation layer to take like my big ideas about what we should build and turn that into like sprints that we can actually, you know, and, uh, you know, points or whatever and, and using the agile methodology. And, um, and they said, yeah, that's the head of engineering's job. And I said, that's really interesting. And I took that and, and it reminded me. And so then I was on the phone, um, this weekend with a founder who is talking about building a software product and similarly, and he's non-technical and, uh, and he, you know, he's he's talking about how he needs to hire a great VP of product to help him build the product. And I said, that reminds me, you know, it's like my friend making the joke, my great friend, Mike Mallon, who has this great line. He says, you know, the non-technical person saying, I want to build a software company. Do you know any great engineers? And it's like saying, you want to start a restaurant. Do you know any good chefs? Yeah. It's like, well, that's kind of like one of the principal ingredients that you should start <laughs> with before deciding that you're going to start a restaurant. And so my point back to this person, which was just reflecting feedback I'd gotten over the last 18 months is you're the head of product. You don't need a head of product. If, if you need a head of product, then you can't be the CEO because you're the head of product. You know, maybe you need a great engineer. And then the other, and, and, and I even said to him, I said, you know, and if, and if you're really building a software company and you really have a great engineer, it's probable that you shouldn't be the CEO either. Maybe mm. you should be, but maybe you shouldn't be. So all of those are just some fun anecdotes because I know our listeners love to hear the frontline stories of, <laughs> of my personal, <laughs> my personal foibles. But my point is that I do not think and if you want, if you want to check out some reviews uh, <laughs> on, on those, <laughs> of how people feel about, you know, my great experience leading products and engineering teams, feel free to check out our glass door. Um, <laughs> that keeps getting, <laughs> it's not fair. Some of the things those people are saying are not fair. Some of it's, oh, I had a glass door uh, review removed. Uh, so sales sound agency brought a bad You can do glass- that? Yeah, you can do that. I can do anything. So basically, (laughs) we got this really bad review. But initially, we didn't know it was a bad review because it was in a different language. It was in German. So one of our employees sent it to me and they're like, here's this review, but it's gibberish. So not sure. And I was like, let's just see. So I put in chat GPT. It's like, no, this is German. It was like a very pointedly bad review. But we've never hired a person who speaks German from Germany, nothing. So we reached out to them and we said, this makes no sense. And they actually removed the review. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's going to happen with us, but <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but the, big, the point I would like to make, I'm happy to talk about Glassdoor. I really am. Uh, and I know our listener. And what I, it's, anyway, we can talk about that as a separate but that can be a topic. But that regardless, my, my overall point is that I do not, I don't think any companies are super eager to bring back lots of middle management. And I think we've all learned that it wasn't clear what some of those people were doing. And our organizations are more fun and run more efficiently with smaller people. And yeah. the size of headcount is not you know, efficiency and growth rate. Those are the things to brag about. Yeah. Not how many people work for the company. You know, this is something that I, we deal with, with our leaders that are wanting to become BPs or they want to, they want to move up. And one of the biggest challenges with it, it, this always comes up is like, Hey, are you in that role today versus are you the V like, are you the VP today? And if you can point to that, 
then, mm. then great. That's fantastic. But what gets lost in this is a lot of people think it's the title that comes first and then, and then the rest of it. And I'm actually, I've had these conversations with, with a handful of folks. It's like, we as CEOs, it's like, how do you teach your people to be leaders? You can I, help support them. Go ahead, Asad. This has to be an inherent like understanding or a belief. I think anyone who has become a great leader kind of inherently knew that, let me just show them what I got. I think the challenge is the schooling system. If you think back to going through university and college, the the people that are highlighted are always leaders. They're, they're leading people and they're leading them greatly. And you come out of, you do your MBA and you think, you know, you're now a trained manager. You've never managed a person. And we got, we get people that apply to jobs. And I've, I personally, when I was a recruiter, I remember speaking to people that had just completed their MBAs and they would say, I'm looking for a management job. And I would say, have you ever managed a person before? They're like, no, but I've done my MBA. And it's like, mm, not sure that you, that qualifies you to become a manager straight out of your program. But there, you come out of these schools with, a, I think, a really confused understanding of what the workspace is about, um, what is cool. Like no one ever highlights the greatest in individual engineer or the enterprise sales. There's this guy that you had teach a course, uh, Sam. I think his name was Jamal. Jamal Reimer. Yeah. His stories are so exciting. Like he's closed these 50, $100 million deals and he writes about them. And it's like so exciting. You're never going to read that in a textbook in school. You don't read about his boss who led this unit towards growth. So I think people come out of school with really mixed expectations or wrong expectations. But AJ, I think if you look back to the times when you've had people that have become great leaders in your organizations, they were showing those traits early on. They were doing the things early on. Well, they were also self-aware of them. They're like, hey, this is this person is going to replace the things I'm doing. Like they're very clear on what that roadmap looks like. And they like articulate it very well to me proactively. And they they have the self-awareness to understand like, hey, and I'm not going to go hire 15 people afterwards to, to do this. Like I'm still going to be doing this work afterwards. So you can still count on me. Yeah. Um, as we get to these inflection points, then we can reevaluate. And I think that that's something that's that's just been challenging more of just like these I've seen it happen pretty frequently where you have these like demands of like, I need to do X, Y, and Z. And I need to go hire these three people. It's like, do you understand the situation at the board level? No. You're reading any of the news out there. <laughs> I so, think, I think anyway. what you said is so uh, is so important, AJ. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that people think like, I get the title and the money, and then I will do what's expected of me. As then opposed to let me demonstrate that I'm qualified to do it for an extended period of time. And then the title and the money come really as recognition of performance as opposed to a bet on the future. And I think some people, there's been a counter argument during, I think, you know, sort of like, I don't know if it would be called, I don't know what it would be called, but maybe part, partially the DEI movement around, hey, that's not fair. You're, you're taking advantage of people. You know, that if you're asking people to do work and not paying them market wages for what they're doing, then really you're just exploiting them. I don't agree with that perspective, but uh, but I think that's the counter argument. My argument has always been, hey, uh, the, I, I had this situation at uh, GLG where I got this massive promotion and I moved from running one of the business units out of like six or seven to managing, we did a reorganization and we consolidated all of global customer success into one global organization that was called research management. I was about 26 or 27 and I was running, you know, 120 people all over the world. And so I was like, this is awesome. And the big title, you know, it was organized like an investment bank. So the big title there is MD, managing director. And uh, it was such a profitable business that everybody was extremely greedy about money. So the minute that I got the promotion, really the shift in job definition or description, I immediately like went to my boss. I was like, so, you know, I'm expecting a title and I'm expecting a lot more money. And he's like, okay, uh, let me talk to Alexander. Alexander is the CEO. We all know him at this point. And I, you know, he, they had me waiting around for a couple of weeks. And then finally he came back. He's like, so I talked to Alexander and uh, we're not giving you a promotion and we're not, we're not giving you a new title and we're not giving you any more money. And I, um, 
I don't know why I felt like so upset, but I, I felt very upset and I went home and I cried actually. Wow. And, um, but that's because I'm a very emotional person, but in hindsight and retrospect, I, and I talked to Alexander about it and he said, isn't the job, the promotion He's like, how old are you? I'm like, I'm, you know, 27. He's like, and you get to manage 120 people all over the world, fly all over the world, you know, take business trips to Singapore and to Hong Kong and to Delhi. I was like, yeah, it's pretty cool. And he was right. I fundamentally think he was right. And I counsel people all the time in Pavilion when I'm doing coaching calls, like stop being so transactional about it. You're, you are earning equity in yourself every mm -hmm. time you have a new experience, every time you get a new opportunity. So. Oh yeah. That, that was, you were 26 managing all those people. There are millions. Why, why do you years? think Late Sam's 20s. so wise right now? He made so many screw ups <laughs> over so the many years. Many screw -ups. Repetitions. So many screw ups. Look at my um, romantic AJ. record. So, <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things in this that uh, stuck out was the fact that 43% of startup employees have less than two years of tenure. It's concerning, but not surprising. Obviously, now, if you're an early stage company, you've only been around four years, it's normal for this to happen. But the, the trend stayed true for companies across various stages. There are obviously benefits of grid tenure. People have more context as to what you're trying to achieve, what your mission is. They're de more deeply integrated into your culture. They are uh, they have more expertise in terms of your space and what you guys are doing. Um, and a lot of our ecosystem doesn't have these advantages well represented within their organization. So as a founder, how concerning is this really? Is this one of those data points that sticks out, but is not really that big of a problem? And how? what's your advice to founders who are trying to counter the negative implications of a low tenure team um, in this market? I don't, I think we had this stat i thought it was 50 percent, closer to 50 percent yeah, when we last spoke sure. about this um a couple quarters ago and i i felt like all three of us were concerned at that time but truthfully i don't i'm not as concerned about it i think that there's um i, I look across our own team and i did the, the analysis the last time so it's now probably two and a half years tenure across our our i think the biggest concern that i see with bigger companies and i'll I'll say use HubSpot as an example, mm -hmm. is that if you have a very complicated product, but it's a very good product and you're learning your sliver, it's really, really hard for that middle level management to get up to speed, get ramp new hires up to speed. And so if you have so many that are below two years and they're looking at the last 10 years of product development and trying to play catch up, now that's that's a pretty big challenge, organizational challenge that's for true. startups. For startups, though, I actually uh, enjoying the. I think there's like a breath of fresh air that can be brought yeah. to to the organization. Um, we hired uh, a customer experience uh, someone to handle the zero to ten um, pretty recently, and like that was was a clear focus, and so they brought that outside experience. I. I think the specialization, as long as you're really trying to solve a real problem and job to be done and opportunity is awesome because you're bringing a fresh set of eyes into it and the market's really talented. So I really like your perspective on this. It's not like, like we, yeah, it's not, I'm actually, that's, that was, when I saw it again, it was kind of where my brain was growing. Well, last time it was concerning um, a lot more. Now I feel like it's one of those data points that you shouldn't look at overall in the organization. You kind right. of have to look at it across levels. Like you need some people in the organization that I'm about to, next month is my 10 years at SDA. SDA needs a couple of people like me who've been around for a very long period of time, but we don't have to, or everyone doesn't have to be here for a very long amount of time. If we're there, we can provide the context to everyone else. And then if we're good with ramping people up, they'll have the Well, content. I think also the reason we were concerned about it last time is because we still were in the middle of a market challenge mm -hmm. and shift. And we didn't know what we didn't know. We didn't know, like there was just so many things that happened when we had Mark Roberge, we were talking about this confluence of AI, working from home, startups, and all of these things were causing so much conflict where today we can like look at each, each thing, um, through its own like siloed or not and it's siloed, played out a bit. So we've seen the benefits of like it play now and we're like, oh, there are some benefits to this as well. Okay, let's take it to compensation because we have a little bit of time left and comp is really interesting as part of this conversation. Thank you for being so mindful of the time, Asad. 
Yeah. Look at this. I'm growing and learning. Well, should we wait? Do we need to hear a word from our sponsors? <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's pay some bills. Come on, sponsors. Hey, CMOs and marketing VPs, that's chief marketing officers, join Pavilion in New York City, the Big Apple, for the CMO Summit on April 18th. The CMO Summit. At CMO Summit, you'll connect with other amazing B2B marketing executives and learn from folks like Udi Lettergore from Gong, Latney Conant of Sixth Sense, Andrew Kale of Help Scout on topics like mastering the customer lifecycle, AI and marketing, and building an iconic brand. Register now at joinpavilion.com forward slash CMO Summit and use the code TOPLINE for an exclusive 15% discount on your ticket. That's joinpavilion.com forward slash CMO Summit and the code TOPLINE for an exclusive 15% discount count on your ticket. I will be there and I look forward to seeing you there. It's going to be fantastic. Here we go. Um, Carter okay. reported that in 2023, salaries stayed quite flat across the various roles and levels that they track, but picked up by about 0.6% in January 2024. This aligns with pavilion data on the salary front, executive compensation, and for context, executives in this context include everyone from the head off till the C-level amalgamated. So it's like a it's a barometer versus a specific role type of uh, signal. So executive compensation salary in 2023 was 220,000, averaged out across all these things. In 2024, it's 225,000, so it's grown up a little bit. What's really interesting in the Pavilion report and something that Carter doesn't report on is total income. For executives in 2023, total income, according to Pavilion, was 478,000. There's been a dramatic drop. It's 330,000 in 2024. So, Sam, this was really interesting to see. We've noticed the same on our end, total income for CRO searches, VPs of sales. So there were so many VPs of sales at Series A companies with 550 to 600K total incomes. They themselves are saying, uh, we're looking for, yeah, it's ridiculous. Like hey, They themselves are saying, we're looking for like four to 450. Like that's where we want to be. So expectations have come down. There's there's some rationality that's settling in. Um, have we have we overcorrected if it's uh, from 478 to 330,000? Because obviously voluntary departures were low last year, um, partly because of the state of the market, right? There weren't a lot of jobs. There was macro in uncertainty. If people had stability, they'll hold on to it. The market's going to improve. And so there will be companies approaching people that might have better comps associated with them. Is that something companies have to worry about? Like, have we overcorrected into retention risk now? Or is this a good thing and we're at a good spot and we don't have to worry about this? I don't think we have to worry. Here's where you have to worry. You have to worry about your VP of sales or CRO getting hired by NVIDIA or <laughs> Anthropic. I'm serious. Or Amazon. Yeah. They're paying, uh, right. Where they're going to make twice as much money. And they're yeah. going to be a senior director or have a different title with less job. Yeah, but is NVIDIA, quick, I just, honest question, NVIDIA hiring sales leaders? I don't know. Uh, that, yes, actually, yes, they are actually. Uh, oh, wow, because I talked to a guy this morning that was thinking about leaving his job at Amazon. And he's like, this is a conversation literally from this morning. I won't say who it is, but somebody that works at Amazon um, in one of their many departments who is in a process with NVIDIA and a bunch of other companies. And he's like, but meanwhile, I want to know, are there any good CRO roles where I can really be a leader? And I'm what? like, there, <laughs> no, there are no good like market right now. I had another conversation. Oh, I had a conversation with a well-known CRO from a company that was, you know, a, a unicorn or very close to a unicorn in 2021 and has been on the bench for a little while, actually has become like a bit of an AI expert as everybody has. But my point is everybody to a T is saying the job market is not particularly good for CRO. And when they say that, what they mean is um, they're also not offering me the money that I think yeah. I should be making. So I, I do not think this is the retention risk at this point to the point of like voluntary departures versus involuntary departures I think the retention risk is broadly people leaving startups, not just getting fired, but leaving startups because and they point, feel like yeah. the promise of the startup has not been realized yeah. versus people uh, and going to big companies. I think that's the bigger risk. I do not, I'm not worried about what I pay 
I don't think people should be worried about paying 400, 450 for series a, the, the, the 500, 600 was a ridiculous, ridiculous. that was literally, Bananas. literally growth at any cost, right? Yeah, that's that what it, it. Yeah. that's what it meant. So no, I don't think anybody has to be worried. I, I think we're back in the, the whole point, right? The whole point is like, Hey, I'm actually probably going to pay you less. You, you can make more money working for marathon asset management or Nomura or Citibank, or, uh, you know, BlackRock or Blackstone, you can work, but you can make more money in finance, or you can make money, more money as a sales contributor or leader at a really big company like Salesforce, where my buddy just had a $17 million year for Salesforce. But wait, what? Yeah. What? Yeah. He's, he sold 17. No, he didn't make 17 million. He oh, sold 17 million. I was like, good he sold grief. 17 million. Let's all go to stuff. Salesforce. <laughs> what are we doing? Yeah. Like, forget, <laughs> forget selling H100s <laughs> for NVIDIA. <laughs> but Two of them is yes, that, call it a day. My point is that um, that's the risk. But I, it, when, I, I think in startup land, we're back to you're going to make less money, you're going to have higher risk. You have to believe that your equity is going to be worth something. Yeah. If you don't believe your equity is going to be worth something, this is going to be an unsatisfying experience for you. And it's also going to be unsatisfying if you don't take into account that you get to do a ton of stuff. Literally, I was, I, you know, I was talking to somebody that worked at Amazon, um, you know, today, to be honest. And, uh, and they were saying, this is the worst place I've ever worked, but the money's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, the tenure, the tenure question that you had before, Austin, we'll see that go up. I think the end of this year, I think yeah. it will linearly start to go three years and, and then four years and on exit, I think to, to Sam's point, because you have to like believe the value of that on exit, you'll have a lot of employees that are longer term. One of the things you haven't said, Asad, from that report, I think it was the Carter report was shutdowns. That was probably one of the most surprising. Well, it wasn't surprising because we've talked about it we've multiple it. times. Yeah. We've called it many times. Yeah. We were just waiting for the data to show up. Um, but I don't know if this is in your world. I haven't felt it from my own network. Sam's probably, Sam, are you, are you hearing anything? Like Carter Data showed how many shutdowns? I think it was uh, 763 if I, if my mind is correct. Last yeah, year. but it was like more than double. It doubled. Uh, year over year it, doubled. Yeah, it doubled all of last year, just in the first quarter, basically. So I don't know if there was a lag of shutdown from it, but um, I, I saw that and I was like, oh. Is that a starting a trend or are we at the, the, is that just all at once at the beginning of the year? And then we're, I mean, I've definitely, I, but I I never, it was never clear to me what it represents. Maybe it also just represents like I'm in touch with more founders and CEOs at this point, but definitely Mm -hmm. have seen anecdotally more shutdowns, just people saying it's not work. I'm going to do something else. AJ, what is, you know, We're talking about hiring and compensation. What about you have a leader, this hypothetical founder has hired a VP of sales when the market was hot and is overpaying this person based on where the market is today, but they like the person. Is there a conversation to be had that, yo, you're 550,000? No, No. there's nothing. I think we we had uh, I'll tell anecdotally um, we had a senior engineer that uh, wasn't wasn't. This is such a great right podcast. Way. You get real dirt here. Real, real dirt. dirt. Well, real dirt that probably real... will get us all in trouble <laughs> <laughs> one day. <laughs> okay, at a previous company, I had a senior engineer <laughs> fifteen years ago. <laughs> but like I've had I've had in the past where senior engineer has asked to go down on a leveling standpoint and. And it, it, it's just not going to work. It, it just That's won't work culturally. Like, you know, there's a mishire and yeah. ultimately you're, you're just like, Hey, this is the, and you write down from a performance standpoint, those things, but I don't, I do not believe just like you will never hire me as a CRO <laughs> or a VP of sales. I can't have <laughs> sales say, I want to be an AE. That does, that's not a thing. But what about like you as a CEO want to keep this VP of sales? No, that, yeah, but that's you think this going. VP of sales is a little bit too, uh, is Same overpaid. You're, you're overpaid. Yeah. I don't, I just don't think any VP of sales or CRO that I've ever known will take a, a smaller paycheck at the same time. Right, have you, you ever, go. have you yeah. ever said, have you ever heard of a CRO being like, yeah, I'll take a smaller OTE? No, I don't. I think they can. I think they can learn how to negotiate. I think they can say, I'll take a smaller OTE, make it up to me in equity. Yeah. Mm, Cause 27 or, year old, Stan, 27 year old Sam would have figured that out. Real quick. <laughs> well, they hope if they're listening to top line, they can, which is, 
Like, yeah. hey, I recognize I'm overpaid relative to where the market is now. Yep. Give me more equity. I'll help the a company out. I'll, I'll be help, by helping the company out. I will be increasing the value of my equity by generating more cash. And maybe um, if I have a severance agreement, you give me severance at the previous salary, but I'll take the lower salary for now. That would be a great I, outcome. I would be a great outcome and humility would be shown. I just think cost of living and how people live their lifestyles make it yeah, really hard. I, I think you're right. I just think that that could be an, an option for people. Oh, this is a really interesting, a good segue to the next part of the conversation because we're going to talk about negotiating now. So we're going to talk about equity a little bit in negotiating. Oh, we, we only have a few minutes. We only have a few minutes. Do we get to do a case study and like actually negotiate against each other? That would be fun. <laughs> we should do that segment. <laughs> Maybe we can do that on top we're of the We're leave this now. interesting part for <laughs> next episode then. You have well, to tune in next week, guys, for this portion. What's the portion? What did you want to talk about? I think the most interesting thing in that was just how many people are not negotiating. For C-level people, only 47% of people negotiated for one week or longer in 2023 and 38% in 2024. And so people are not negotiating and it's leading to horrible packages. Like hardly anyone has severance. 71% of execs don't have severance in 2024. That's bananas. That is bananas. Um, 8% of people, this is all Pavilion data. Pavilion's report was great. Only 8% of people have a single trigger clause. And also, this is this I went deep to find this out and we can end it there. 38% of C-level executives in sales at companies with 10 to 30 million in ARR did not know what type of stock grant they got. They didn't even know what it was. Like that's wild. That is wild. That, that is wild. wild. Um, it's all well. All of this is just about leverage. Everybody had leverage in 2020, even more in 2019 and 2021. And people are scared now. This is the point of getting me getting. I got. I have a text message and I got a phone call this morning. Both people saying who are in good jobs. Both people in good jobs saying. Should I go look for, uh, you know, how's the market for CROs? And I'm like, not good. Stay where you are. Yeah, relax. Don't leave. <laughs> it's okay. If you, if you are hiring a CRO and you, you learn, there's so much information asymmetry in an interview process. And I think a lot, you learn a lot towards the last mile of the process. If you're hiring a CRO who doesn't negotiate or VP of sales, who's not even negotiating, they're not even trying you should be really concerned. Like that Very should concerned. be concerning. You, there's a, there's a Goldilocks bad. amount of negotiation. If they're focusing on like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's my tech stipend? Okay. Yeah. Or, you know, how many vacation days? Or, you know, what's your response policy on the weekends? That's the wrong person. But if yeah. they don't negotiate at all, that's problematic. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Let's go to shout outs and wins of the week. Uh, we're going to start, who would like to go first between Asad and AJ, my two A's, my two A boys, my good boys. Asad's going very first. Good boys. I can go first. My very, um, very good boys. My very good boys. <laughs> yeah, very good. Good boys. Um, You're a very good boy. <laughs> yes, good I am. Boy. I do this every boy. morning. I look in the mirror. I'm like, You're a good boy. Yeah, yeah very good uh, boy. Oh, you're so cute. <laughs> um, I want to shout out Colin from your team. I, 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 Colin Jenny. Uh, she's doing such a phenomenal job in supporting the three of us with the podcast. And we have some really exciting upgrades to uh, to branding, sound quality, all these things that we're going to be doing as we cross the one-year mark. And it's just really cool to see other people who on their own are excited about the podcast and all the work that they put in to help us advance this. So shout out to them, her and Josh especially. They really help us do what we do and no one knows them. But now hopefully a few people know them. I love that. I'll hey, shout Jim. out the other supporter who we've uh, shouted out previously, but Jesse Shipman um, has some really awesome, amazing host, co-host shirts for us that we <laughs> all have to purchase uh, for sure. So uh, she's a, a loyal listener and I know she'll hear this shout out as well. So Jesse in the Dem Denver chapter. She's head. the Denver chapter head. Yeah. 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 Uh, so thank you, Jesse, for for all the work. But um, we're gonna have we're gonna wear these shirts at he some point. He's gonna wear his permanent VP I've actually of marketing all to the board <laughs> meeting. <laughs> I purchased all three of them. Just, just so amazing. Clear. <laughs> I I will shout out Charlie Moss, uh, who's another very active contributor in our new top line 
yes. Pavilion Slack channel where anybody that's listening can join for free to engage with us. Uh, we're going to do AMAs in there. We're going to have you review the docket. Um, for next week, we should probably post the docket into that channel so that people can chime in with comments oh, and stuff that. like that. But Charlie, thanks for all. Thanks for listening because you're always you're always contributing and you've been a great Pavilion member as well. Cullen Denny, uh, Andrew Seem, Dan Masood, Cullen Denny. Cullen Denny was the third person ever hired at Pavilion when it was called Revenue Collective. And she interviewed in the we, at the WeWork on 7th Avenue and 14th Street in the beginning of 2020. She's been with us uh, over four years. Yeah. What were your, what were your interview questions at the time? What was like your hard interview? It, like we were sitting, I was like, can you speak English? Uh, you know, you, are you a smart Maybe there's person? a lesson you somehow there got Sam made some great hires early on, like Carly, Talon, like you stumbled into yeah, it. Yeah, well, a lot okay. of the, many of those people, uh, you know, we're going to be doing this new, uh, part of our new comp philosophy is refreshed option grants for people that hit their three-year mark. And Cullen is definitely on that list. So Cullen, for if sure. you're listening, you'll get some additional equity in Pavilion soon. Um I do. Want, and then lastly, uh, we're in this offsite where I'm recording this today, led by Robbie Kelman Baxter. Robbie's written two books, uh, The Forever Transaction and The Membership Economy. And I met her because I was on her podcast and she has done an outstanding job leading a conversation today about ways that we can improve the, the experience for Pavilion members and deliver more value. And it's just so many... It's not even that they're obvious. It's just sometimes you forget when you're running a company that you're not the first person to think of how to do this. And you're not the first person to ever run a company. And it's okay to ask other people how they've done it. And she is an expert on membership businesses. And it's it's so refreshing because you're stuck. It's the reason Pavilion exists, right? You're stuck thinking these are five ways we could solve this problem. And somebody walks in and says, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, I've tried all five of those. Here's the yeah. answer to the question. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, Robbie, great job. And with that, I uh, hope everybody listens to Top Line Hotline on Thursday. And uh, thank you both for another incredible episode. Give us five stars on wherever you listen. You get your podcasts and uh, join us in our Slack channel. And God bless you. Bye, everyone. This episode was brought to you by the book Ecosystem Led Growth, a new book by Crossbeam CEO Bob Moore. Pre order your copy at elgbook.com. That's elgbook.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of Top Line. To learn more about the trends, news, and developments impacting the world of B2B SaaS, head to joinpavilion.com, where more than 10,000 of the world's top go to market leaders. Go to achieve and unlock their full professional potential.